You know that from time to time I like to do things a little bit differently. I'll take off my stole and say, I'm not Pastor Kurt any longer, I'm somebody else. I'm not Peter today, I'm not some angel, I am John, the younger brother of James. Over the past 600 years in Israel, we have only known 30 years of independence. I'm tired. We're tired of having to bow down to foreign rulers, afraid that if, if we step just a little bit out of line, that if we don't behave ourselves like good, obedient little children, then we will feel the rod and the lash of our overlords. For 600 years or more, we have been told, have patience. God will send our Messiah to redeem us, someone who will liberate us from our oppressors and return us to the glory days of the King of David. Many still hope for this. On the other hand, some, like the Sadducees, have said it's just a fairy tale, and it's time to grow up, adapt, and move on. Some, like the Essenes, have decided to withdraw from the world, living in their own isolated little insular enclave. Some, like the Zealots, have gotten tired of waiting for God and taken up arms to fight the Romans. And some, well, some, some wonder whether God has just simply abandoned us altogether. I too was beginning to wonder that myself when I first met Jesus. For many years, I'd helped my father and my older brother, James, fish in the Sea of Galilee. We were more fortunate than most. Our little collection of boats let us hire others so that they and their families wouldn't starve. But so much of our income went to the Romans, and in particular to corrupt tax collectors. You know those types. When Jesus appeared that day along the Sea of Galilee and invited James and me to follow him, to, to fish for people, as he put it, I couldn't help myself. Before I knew what I was doing, I, I let go of my net, was up on standing on my feet, following after this unknown rabbi Jesus. Clearly, there was something different about this rabbi. All rabbis, or all other rabbis, wait for prospective followers to come to them. But here he was, seeking out disciples without any sort of conversation or interview. He just said, come. And James and I, we just follow. At the same time, you could see in his body, the way he carried himself, that he carried hope in his heart. But not some mindless optimism. It had depth to it. He was like the Sadducees in that in the need to adapt. Come and I will teach you to fish for people. But it was a call to something new and not an acquiescing to the Romans. Like the Essenes, he was gathering people up and around himself, but he was engaged in the world, not running away from it. And like the Zealots, he knew things needed to change, but he wore no sword. There was no blood on his clothes or on his hands, like there had been with so many others that had claimed to be God's Messiah at some point or other. James and I looked at each other that day wearing the exact same expression, wordlessly wondering, could this be the one we've been waiting for all along? Could this be God's Messiah? He was both familiar and different, but we didn't realize just how different until he started going around preaching and teaching, healing and caring. Oh, sure, there were the times when he miraculously healed people and cast out demons and even raised the dead. We'd heard those kinds of stories from the rabbis about Elijah and Elisha and all the amazing things that God had done through them. But, of course, those were stories from centuries ago. Nobody had seen anything like it since. But here it was now, right before our very eyes. But when this rabbi started saying things that challenged the teachings of Moses, and I don't mean, you know, your, your third cousin twice removed on your mother's side, Moses. <laughs> I mean the Moses. You know, that, that made people sit up and take notice. You have heard it said, thou shalt not commit adultery. 
But I say to you, said Jesus, that if you look at a woman with lust, you have committed adultery in your heart. And you have heard it said, you shall not commit murder. But I say to you, that if you are angry with your brother or sister, you have committed murder in your heart. That was shocking to say the need to least. Needless to say. But if you thought about it, it really didn't challenge what Moses said, though it certainly challenged the common wisdom of the Pharisees and scribes and how they interpreted the laws of Moses. But what really challenged me was when Jesus went beyond Moses. That was when the foundation of my faith was truly shaken. When Jesus said, blessed are the destitute, for the reign of God is theirs, I thought he was crazy. Since my early childhood, I can remember my father praising and praying and singing the Psalms, praising God for blessing the righteous and, and uh, making us prosper. We wanted to be rich because that was the sign that God was with us, that we were living according to the laws of Moses with integrity. But now Jesus was saying that it, not only was the reign of heaven for the destitute, but that the rich would have a hard time getting in. When Jesus said, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy, I thought he was nuts. Being merciful is just to just gave your enemies time to, to reorganize and come back and get you later. Mercy was for the powerful because they could afford to bless those who had less and protect themselves from retribution later on. But now Jesus was saying that not only was the reign of heaven was for the merciful, but those who didn't show mercy wasn't, weren't going to get it either. When Jesus said, blessed are the meek, the pure in heart, the peacemakers, the persecuted, the opposite of everything I'd ever been taught, I thought, oh, he's trying to fool the powers that be. So that way then when the time was right, Jesus would pop out and say, surprise! And there would be a great army behind him. He would seize the throne of David and drive those Romans out. Now I get you, Jesus. Great idea. But then one day, when we were alone, just Jesus and us 12 disciples, no crowds, no Pharisees and scribes, nobody that Jesus was needing to fool, he asked us who people thought he was. When we responded, John the Baptist, Elijah, Jeremiah, one of the other prophets, he then asked us who we thought he was. Peter was the first one to jump in to say, you are God's Messiah. And we all vigorously nodded our heads in agreement. Then Jesus said that he would soon go to Jerusalem. And we all leaned in, believing that the day we'd all been waiting for was finally approaching. We were all wanting to hear the hidden plan in all of its glorious details. And then he told us the plan. In Jerusalem, he would undergo suffering at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed. I think he said something about rising from the dead on the third day, but like all the other disciples, I was still stuck on the part where Jesus said that he was going to be killed and die soon. Surely there must be some mistake. Surely we, we misheard him. Why would he talk about dying? The people he needed to fool weren't anywhere around? When we realized that he was serious, Peter exclaimed, God forbid it. But Jesus rebuked Peter, telling Saul that we needed to take up our crosses and follow him. For five days, we walked around in a daze, our hearts filled with confusion and, and dismay, questioning whether we, we had gotten Jesus all wrong, wavering as to whether or not we could believe anything he had ever said. On the sixth day, Jesus took Peter, James, and myself up a high mountain. And there, there he was transfigured. Jesus shone with the glory that we thought was his, but had begun to question in our hearts. And then we saw Moses and Elijah there speaking with Jesus. While we were still trying to figure out what to do next, I mean, should we build some tents, Jesus? A cloud settled on the mountaintop, and like a scene from out of the Exodus, a voice said, this is my son, the beloved. 
with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. We fell down trembling in fear, but Jesus reached out and touched us and said, do not be afraid. And when we looked up, it was just Jesus and the three of us alone. On our hike back down the mountain, I realized that in a not so subtle way, God, concealed in the cloud, had revealed to us just what we needed to see and hear. We saw Moses and Elijah there, but not King David. There wasn't going to be a violent uprising. Violence was the tool of the oppressor. There was, however, going to be a revolution. Jesus had meant everything that he had ever said about the destitute, the meek, the peacemaker, and the persecuted. And our whole world was going to be turned, has been turned, upside down. Everything that we thought was true, that, the, that everything that was part of the foundation of our world, Jesus just threw out the window. Jesus had called us to repentance, to see things from a whole new point of view. Of course, Jesus was right. He did suffer and die in Jerusalem. And on the third day, he rose again from the dead. And our lives will never be the same again. Jesus has redeemed us from all the powers of sin and death and evil and to give us new life. But even knowing all that, there are days when I have a hard time believing in the radical words of Jesus about the reign of God. And when that happens, I think back on that day, on that mountaintop with Jesus, and the words of God echo through me. This is my son, the beloved, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Amen.